Good morning. My name is Karen King. I am the Community Affairs, Affairs Liaison with the Office of New Haven Affairs at Yale University. Uh, welcome to our monthly community breakfast, which we have been holding virtually uh, during the pandemic. Um, We're so glad that you are uh, continuing to join us. Hopefully we will be back in person at some point relatively soon, but I'm glad to see you all here um, safe and healthy. Uh, we have a great uh, team of presenters this morning presenters this morning from the Yale Center for British Art. Uh, I want to make a few announcements uh, before we get started. Um, and I will share my screen <clears throat> so that you can uh, follow along with me. Uh, so as I mentioned, I am uh, um, in the Office of New Haven Affairs at, here at Yale University. I would invite you to have that be your first stop if you're looking for information on events um, and resources that are available at the uh, um, at Yale University. Even though most of our world is virtual, there is a lot that is going on. Um, I do want to highlight this upcoming events portion, which ha um, usually has a ton of events that are um, still available through our Pathways to Science and Pathways to Arts and Humanities program, which, as a reminder, is a program that is open to uh, New Haven uh, public school New Haven students. Um, it's a free program uh, for any students who are interested in STEM or the arts and humanities fields um, and their uh, families as well. Free workshops throughout the year. Uh, the uh, uh, Beinecke Library hosts the Wyndham Campbell Awards every year. There is a festival that is virtual this year that introduces everyone to the writers that um, are um, honored and awarded um, each year. Uh, this year, there are a number of, of again, a, a slate of wonderful writers that were, have been recognized. Um, each one of these writers receives an unrestricted uh, grant of $165,000 uh, from Wyndham Campbell. And they also are featured in a number of uh, talks uh, and appearances. I'm going to put the link to the Wyndham Campbell uh, website in the chat. There are a number of upcoming uh, Zoom events that I invite you to take uh, part in so that you can learn more about these wonderful writers and their works. Uh, on uh, October 12th at 5.30, from 5.30 to 6.30, the Yale uh, um, Latino Networking Group and the Future Leaders of Yale are hosting an evening of Argentine tango. Uh, this is a virtual event. It's um, You can uh, you'll view a slideshow, some performances, and then you can take a virtual class uh, to get yourself moving and to learn uh, more about um, this wonderful art form. Uh, I will put a link to the registration in the chat as well. I'll also link the Peabody Museum's uh, Peabody at Home uh, program. The Peabody, although it is going, it's closed physically for an extensive and wonderful renovation, uh, they are continuing to be quite lively with um, online offerings, workshops, and uh, meetings for people to still interact with Peabody staff and Peabody collections. Uh, the Peabody at Home uh, site is uh, just one of the features um, that they are offering um, to the public. And it's a way for you and your family to um, uh, learn together and also participate in activities, um, home-based activities together. Uh, and one final reminder, uh, the Yale, Yale University is committed to hiring New Haven residents. The Yale New Haven Hiring Initiative is the uh, focus of these efforts. There is a uh, mighty team of uh, people in the Yale New Haven Hiring um, Initiative office who are focused on um, outreach to New Haven residents, providing information to people and helping people um, work through the process of applying um, to jobs here at Yale. I will put a link to the newsletter in the chat so that you can stay on top of initiatives that are taking place um, uh, through the Yale New Haven Hiring Initiative. On to our speakers. Uh, today, um, today's talk is titled New Light on the Portrait of LFU Yale, Members of His Family and an Enslaved Child. With us are a number of presenters uh, from the Yale Center for British Art. 
we um, please join me in welcoming Courtney J. Martin. Uh, Courtney became the Paul Mellon Director of the Yale Center for British Art in 2019, a decade after earning a PhD in art history from Yale. An art historian, curator, and professor, Martin began working with the New York-based Dia Found Art Foundation in 2015 and was appointed Deputy Director and Chief Curator in 2017. She previously taught at Brown University and at the Ford Foundation. Joining her is Linda Friedlander, who has been the head of education at the Yale Center for British Art since 1996. She has created after-school programs and museum visits throughout the school year for young adults, as well as classes for internships and high school and college students. Linda has also had long-running classes at the center to increase the center's neurodiverse, neurodiverse audiences. This includes weekly visits from the Chapel Haven Schleifer Center for Adults and weekend programs for children on the autism spectrum. Dr. Edward Town is head of collections information and access at the Yale Center for British Art. His research focuses on the production of art in the early modern period. He has published numerous uh, articles, including a biographical dictionary of London painters, 1547 to 1625, and with Jessica David, George Gower, portraitist, mercer, sergeant painter. He was a co-author and contributor to Painting in Britain, 1500 to 1630, and Marking Time, Objects, People, and Their Lives, 1500 to 1800. Um, Abigail Lamphier is the senior cur curatorial assistant in the Department of Paintings and Sculpture at the Yale Center for British Art. Born in New Haven and raised in the area, she has worked at the center for 20 years and is a supporter of the local arts community. Most recently, she convened and moderated a conversation between the wonderful artist Titus Kafar, who received his master's in fine arts from Yale in 2006, and art collectors Arthur Lewis and Hal Nguyen as part of the center's online symposium, The Politics of, of the Portrait. And rounding out the team is Eric James, the software engineer at the Yale Center for British Art. His work includes developing the online collection and maintaining the center's digital asset, assets. Please, excuse me, please help me welcome Courtney J. Martin. Hi, thank you so much, Karen, for that kind introduction uh, to the LIQ Yale group. We are extremely proud of the work that they have done and I too am looking forward to today's presentation. Um, I just want to give a brief sort of intro as to how we got here. Um, when I first arrived um, at the center in 2019, and actually even before then, people contacted me to ask what I would do about this painting, um, as if somehow this painting stood for the whole of the collection. As an art historian, um, a former graduate student here at Yale, and a former student worker at the Yale Center for British Art, I was really surprised that that one single painting stood for the whole for many people. Um, and yet I could understand why, because there is disturbing imagery. There is a child shown um, in a shackle. Uh, this is not uncomplicated and it is not without uh, some real um, discussion needed to be able to show a painting like that and to be able to contextualize it within the realms of both art history as well as cultural studies. Um, in thinking about what to do with the painting, many other things happened in that first year, like the pandemic. And then by the summer of 2020 um, and the murder of George Floyd, I had finally figured out that we needed to take some real action around this painting because I think for us as a historic collection, we needed to have a better sense of how the current politics had real weight in its history and what where those prior stories around black people and the Atlantic slave trade were coming to bear on this current collection and in this current moment. Um, I began talking uh, to staff and many staff like Lori Mazura and David Thompson stepped up immediately to uh, really want to know more. Um, they were then joined by Edward Town and Abby Lamphere and Eric James who have then taken on the bulk of this work. What I think is important here is that as a public facing venue and as a venue for art that we become a place where discussion can happen, where dialogue is created and fostered, but also in which we are really focused on what the object has to tell us. So now I wanna turn over to you, um, or rather to, to Abby and Ed and, and Eric um, to actually tell us what is it that the object has to tell us. Thanks for having us. Thanks for that, Courtney. I'm just going to share my screen. There we go. 
if anything gets funky, let me know. Um, I'm at home, but I think I'm on a good wireless connection. Good morning. I'm Abigail Lamphere, Senior Curatorial Assistant in the Department of Paintings and Sculpture at the Center. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. It's awesome to see so many colleagues from everywhere across the university in New Haven this morning. Um, I've been thrilled to be involved in this project, but honestly, the for me, the real honor has been sharing this work with others. In late summer of 2020, Courtney Martin convened a curatorial group consisting of colleagues from as she mentioned, various departments across the institution to work collaboratively with the following goal, to re-examine and recontextualize the large group portrait that features the university's early benefactor and namesake, Elihu Yale, and an enslaved child. The mostly web-based project makes known the painting's presence in our collection and attempts to make transparent our relationship to its complex history and difficult associations. The painting was given to the center in 1970 by the 11th Duke of Devonshire in honor of Paul Mellon. Its acquisition was championed by the center's first director, Jules Prown, for its likeness of Yale and Prown's belief that it underlined the ties between England and America. It was the first painting to formally enter the collection, predating the Louis Kahn building you're familiar with by several years. Before it even came to New Haven, there was discussion of pursuing technical analysis to help clear up some unresolved questions, but for one reason or another, that work never happened. We've carried out a renewed study to aid in answering fundamental questions about the painting, who was depicted, who made it and why, how did the picture come to Yale, how has it been displayed, and most importantly, how can the center ensure that the picture is contextualized in a manner appropriate to the distressing history it represents? The group's first visible act was to remove the historical portrait from the wall so it could undergo analysis and replace it with this contemporary response piece by Titus Kafar, titled Enough About You. Kafar, who received his Yale MFA in 2006 and is a recipient of numerous prizes and awards, is a New Haven-based American artist, if you weren't aware already, who works across the media to examine the history of pictorial representation. He physically manipulates his canvases by cutting, twisting, breaking, and tearing reconfiguring historical works of art to reveal unspoken truths and overlooked subjects. His practice challenges art historical images and the narratives they normalize. Kafar had seen the Elihu Yale group portrait when it was on display in the center's 2014 exhibition, Figures of Empire, Slavery and Portraiture in 18th Century Atlantic Britain. Interestingly, before 2014, the painting had spent most of its half a century at Yale in basement storage, as it was not put on view save for a 1981 exhibition on the conversation piece, and later it spent some time in a residential college dining hall. Enough About You directly responds to the group portrait by reworking and collapsing its composition and literally reframing the child to shift the viewer's focus. The far sensitive revision removes the silver collar and shifts the child's gaze outward at the viewer. In his own words, he wanted to find a way to imagine a life for this young man that the historical painting had never made space for in the composition. His desires, dreams, family, thoughts, hopes, those things were never subjects that the original artist wanted the viewer to contemplate. The research project and this intervention in the gallery space became a springboard for the center's three-part online symposium, The Politics of the Portrait series of conversations among artists, collectors, curators, and scholars to consider potential approaches, revisions, and additions to the canon of art history, curating, and art making. The third and final program was a conversation held a few weeks ago on September 17th between Titus Kafar and the art collectors Arthur Lewis and Hao Nguyen, who had generously loaned enough about you to the center. Lewis and Nguyen have built an art collection renowned for its focus on contemporary women artists and artists of color. For more than a decade, the couple has supported Black artists and developed their local art community in Los Angeles. Um, but they also support New Haven um, because they have supported many of the artists that have come through um, Next Haven, which I'll talk about in a moment. The talk focused on Kafar's practice, how enough about you came to be, and the evolution of Titus's work. Here we see on the left, another painting based on a portrait of Elihu Yale. Um, the original reference painting uh, is at the Yale University Art Gallery. And this was also created in 2016, the same year as Enough About You. 
all of the known portraits of Elihu Yale um, are in the university's various collections across campus. The painting on the right was the cover image of Time Magazine's June 5th, 15th, 2020 um, issue, which featured a special report of the nationwide protests brought on by the murder of George Floyd at the hands of police in Minneapolis. Kadar also discussed his commitment to the next generation of artists and curators and his relationship to the local community. He lives and works in New Haven, remaining committed to the city. In 2015, he co-founded Next Haven, a 45,000 square foot arts incubator located in the Dixwell neighborhood which offers fellowships, residencies, and other professional development opportunities to artists, curators, and students in the New Haven community and beyond. Everyone at the center was really excited to see the intervention of Enough About You in the collection galleries and feedback from the public has been very positive. The physical act of replacing the historical portrait felt energizing and important. Fortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic has continued on longer than any of us originally anticipated. And Enough About You was taken down in late May and returned to its owners before the center reopened to the public. For the duration of the summer, until just yesterday actually, the wall was left blank as a moment to pause and reflect and to listen to our audiences. A text panel explaining the omission invited visitors to share their thoughts through the center's website. A new display is currently being installed, which will bring the historical group portrait uh, back to the wall in a different context alongside supporting material to show what's been learned about it. I will hand over to my colleague, Ed. Thank you, Abby, and good morning, everyone. I'm going to talk briefly, um, but in some detail, about the research that's been undertaken over the last year or so by um, the group that's been introduced to you this morning. It's important to note that this work is ongoing and um, that we still are very keen to hear from our audiences um, so that mechanism by which people can um, share their thoughts is still um, live and Eric will be saying a little bit about that um, in the final part of this presentation. As Abby's mentioned, um, the painting we're discussing this morning depicts the university's early benefactor, Eli Yale. He is the gentleman sat um, in the center of the table wearing uh, a purple coat. And I'm just gonna sort of walk people through this painting slowly, just so we can take in. Obviously it's, a, it's quite a, it's an old painting. It's a dark painting. Um, it's not a painting of particularly high quality. So worthwhile just sort of zooming in at some details. So we, we're starting um, at the table with the right proper hand of Elihu Yale. And on his pinky finger, you can see uh, a gold ring set with a ruby. And I start here because this is the source of Eli Yale. It points to the source of Eli Yale's wealth. He was a official, a, um, a governor and president of the East India Company. Um, so that's a, primarily in the late 17th and early 18th century, that's a trading company. He's responsible for the company's outpost, the fortified port of Fort St. George um, in modern day Chennai, then known as Madras. And Yale enriches himself by trading privately in precious stones, such as rubies and diamonds. In doing so, he accumulates vast wealth. Behind him is a young man who, like all of the um, men in the foreground of the painting, wears a periwig or a, a powdered wig and holds in his left hand a book which he keeps open with his middle finger. The men are enjoy, enjoying wine, so they're drinking a fortified wine um, from glass um, goblets and on the table is um, paraphernalia for smoking tobacco. 
On the right of the painting is a child um, who we understand to be 10 years old. He wears a turban and um, a miniature version of the same dress that the men, um, the seated men are wearing, a large coat, undergarment, and around his neck, a silver padlock collar indicative of his enslaved status. He is in the process here of um, uncorking um, a bottle of wine, uh, which we sort of read as being uh, wrapped in a, a wicker case or what might equally be a wineskin. The young boy um, was probably brought to England um, at around the age of around five or six to serve in the households of one of the seated men. We, we still don't know which. Um, this is one of the most invidious aspects of um, Britain's entrenchment in the transatlantic slave trade in the late 17th and 18th century. That is um, the ensnarement of children, principally boys, um, from either the west coast of Africa or Britain's former overseas colonies to serve in the households of um, wealthy individuals such as Yale and members of his family. Now, slavery was demonstrably um, illegal according to British law. Nevertheless, um, as we'll see, hundreds so almost certainly thousands of children were brought into Britain in this fashion. And it's only after 1772 that some um, sort of clarity is brought to the law and this really distasteful practice is, is beginning to be brought to an end. Here, I'm just showing you a detail in slightly brighter lights. So you can see that, that him pulling the cork away from the bottle. On the table are other um, products, that, that tobacco, the product, that another product of Britain's um, overseas colonies and almost certainly the product of enslaved um, labor. The, man, the men are going to light their pipes using um, a candle sat on a silver candlestick. And in the background of the painting, a number of children perform a country dance um, to the violin um, played by a young man who can't be much more than 20. So I'm just gonna talk, Abby's mentioned quick, briefly, but I'll just um, recap. This painting was the first picture to enter the center's collection formally. Um, it was not a painting purchased by Paul Mellon, the center's benefactor, but a gift of the Duke of Devonshire um, made at the behest of the, of the institution's first director, Jules Crown. It's rarely been on display, in the galleries um, and has spent much of its time the, the, the last half century in basement storage. This was um, the, the, one of the rare occasions it was um, put on display was in 2014 during the Figures of Empire um, exhibition. You can see it here, it was the frontispiece uh, to a four bay display um, that confronted this topic of um, slavery within Britain sort of yeah, the presence of enslaved um, attendants in as depicted in portraiture um, in Britain in British art from the 18th century. As Abby mentioned um, last year the painting was taken down from the wall um, in order for us to undertake a technical study of the painting. So the first time this has ever been undertaken and here you can see the large canvas painting on the left in the painting conservation studio. And you'll also see the, on the right, a much smaller version, um, also owned by Yale, um, but this time in the collection of the Yale University Art Gallery. So this is a, a, a version that's made on copper um, probably after the canvas painting was made. And here, um, okay, so the, the scale of this, this slide is very misleading. Obviously, the painting on the left is far, far larger than the painting on the right, but you can see how closely that smaller version um, follows the larger version and actually goes some way towards um, rectifying 
some of the awkwardness um, in the composition. And I'm going to say a little bit about why um, it, the painting on the left is, is so odd, and it has to do with the way in which um, it was made. Um, here, you can, in the copper version, uh, you can see that there's a greater sense of perspective and the children um, sit more in the background, um, are, are sort of more believable in their, their presence. They don't float in that ghostly way. The enslaved child is set back slightly as to try and improve the sense of perspective. These paintings, the, the smaller version um, is, has a very close relationship to the larger one um, and follows it so closely, in fact, that we believe it's by the same artist. Um, no detail is misunderstood or mistranslated when the painting is brought down in scale. So we look, when we're looking for the artist, we're looking for an artist who works in canvas and on a far smaller scale on copper support. I'm now going to talk about identities um, and the way in which the, the various spurious identities have been grafted onto these paintings over the, um, over the centuries. Now, this painting has never been exhibited in Britain. Um, it's never, was never included in, it's never been included in an exhibition. And first, the first record of it appearing in print is in the late 19th century um, in an antiquarian journal. And it's in a private collection. And all, this, all that's said about it is that Elihu Yale is shown with his son-in-law, Lord James Cavendish, and the second Duke of Devonshire. That's what's thought about the picture at the time. Now, as the sort of decades roll on, um, other people come in and make guesses, really, about who the other people um, in the painting might be. So there's a suggestion that the children in the background are those of the second Duke of Devonshire. Um, and then there's the suggestion, instead, that the man in the blue coat is someone called Mr. Tunstall, who's believed to be a lawyer who's brokering a marriage agreement between Elihu Yale and Lord James Cavendish for the marriage of Yale's daughter Anne to Lord James Cavendish. Now, all along, there is no men it, there's no mention of the, of the child's the enslaved child's identity whatsoever. Then. In 1937, these sort of these identities that are swirling around the white citizen in the painting land in the current configuration. And Mr. Tunstall becomes the young um, man standing at the top left. And um, people seem to decide that the man in the blue coat is the second Duke of Devonshire. So he's the older brother of Lord James Cavendish. And the idea is that Yale is discussing with the senior member of the Devonshire family, um, discussing this, uh, uh, this mar marriage contract. But we now know that the reality is quite different. A paint sample taken um, from the blue coat of the man seated in the foreground has revealed the presence of a pigment called Prussian blue. Now, why is this important? It's important because Prussian blue um, was first manufactured, as the name would suggest, in Prussia uh, in 1709. And that is the year after James Cavendish married Anne Yale. So that immediately, uh, sort of overnight, exploded that long-standing tradition about what this painting depicts and who was depicted. Um, these are, I'm just showing you two cross sections. So this is like less than the size of a pinhead. And these um, elements have been analyzed at the Institute for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage. And it's the darker pigments that you can see here are the Prussian blue. Um, it's a blend of paint, so blend of pigment, Prussian blue and indigo. And that's giving that vibrant blue. Prussian blue is only invented in 1709, as I mentioned. And it takes about a decade for it to move um, across the sea and enter the palettes of British artists. And um, here you can see in cross section. So this is like a slice, of, imagine this is sort of like a slice of cake um, that's taking us from the ground layer um, through the preparatory layers up to that blue. And you can see uh, those dark pigments there. That's, um, that's the Prussian blue. So what's the upshot of this? The painting can't date to 1708. That was completely wrong. 
and it must be a it must be later. But what then of the identities of the sitters? Now we can be confident that Eli Yale and James Law Cavendish that this is accurate because their likenesses match those in other portraits. That's not the case for the uh, man seated in the foreground. Now we know what the second Duke of Devonshire looked like because um, there are portraits of him at the National Portrait Gallery London and elsewhere. He's also a member of a knightly order, the Order of the Garter, um, which dictates that at all times when he's um, depicted in portraiture, he has to be wearing the garter star, which you can see on the left, one on his chest, and the man on the right is clearly not wearing anything of the sort. Here's another portrait. Um, this um, is not the same man. So this, this identity is, is quite clearly wrong. We have the Duke of Devonshire on the left, someone else on the right. Now, casting around, we're now confident that the man on the right is someone called Dudley North. Now, this is Yale's other son-in-law, someone he would have described simply as his son um, in the parlance of the day. Dudley North married Catherine Yale, who's seen in the middle of this picture, um, and they had three children together um, prior to her death in 1715. So we now know this is Yale and his sons-in-laws, and there's no marriage contract being signed. Far from it, these men are taking refreshment, not um, undertaking business. We now know as well that the children in the background are almost certainly Yale's grandchildren, and it's likely that the man playing violin to them is someone called Obadiah Shuttleworth, who taught their grandchildren country dancing and violin. What about the man on standing behind him? He's surely too young to be a lawyer, far more likely to be David Yale, um, Yale's adopt, Eli Yale's adopted heir. Now, David Yale was born in New Haven, and we now know quite a bit more about him and his family. This is the probate inventory, uh, which we discovered of um, David Yale's father, John. He dies in 1711, or an inventory of his goods is, brought up, is pulled up in 1712. And he's a, so he's a large planter in, in New Haven in the downtown area, and his properties extend all the way towards North Haven. So amongst the um, property that's valued and enumerated in this inventory are four African-American um, enslaved people um, who are listed um, in this inventory. So we know that Yale's New Haven family were certainly slaveholders in New Haven. And here's the, the two um, portraits of the young David Yale, Elihu's adopted heir. He has an adopted heir because he has no sons. And you can see the two pictures side by side. This is um, the beginning of a display that's going to present um, the latest thinking. David Yale was a late addition to the composition. This um, micro detail of his nose on the right um, shows that he's painted on top of the uh, green background. So he was, he's a late arrival to the composition. Now, so we now have a, a new set of identities for everyone aside from the child. And that tells its own story and speaks to the gaps in the, ar in the paper archive of the, regarding the black presence. Now we've scoured every parish register um, in the, uh, in the, Area of areas of London in which Yale and his sons-in-law were living. Um, that's Bloomsbury, near to where the British Museum is today. Yale lived in Queen Square. And you can see that there was a strong black presence in that area. But unfortunately, um, even though th there's, there's, no, um, re there's no record that can, we can confidently um, tie to, to the depiction of the child in the painting, Actually, the first one that appears there um, is 17, January 1716 of Thomas Cotter. That's a possibility, but you're looking at here, this is a verbatim transcription of the um, parish register. Um, you can see that there just isn't enough information there for us to be confident uh, this is the person being depicted. So, as I mentioned, when, when enslaved people were brought to Britain, often at the age of five or six, or possibly as adults, they're baptized. And that's the only record that we often have of their, of their presence. Could it be that Dudley North's um, proximity to the child is indicative of the relationship that, between the two of them? Was the child a member of his household? We still simply don't know. 
we're currently un undertaking research by by proxy um, in Britain because Dudley North's papers survive. They don't for Yale or James Cavendish. So this is our only hope, really, of, of finding a record of the child in his personal papers. There was certainly a presence, um, a black presence in uh, Dudley North's wider family. A relative of his um, had within his household um, a young man called Francis Juba. Um, and you can see um, this, this reference here in the center page. And right at the end, you can see that he's about eight years old when he's baptized. Now I'm hopeful that we might find a record of this for the child in the painting. To be clear, this Francis Juba is not the child, but I'm just trying to give a sense of where we're looking and how we're looking. At present, we don't know what happened next in this child's life. It could be like 800 other people of African and Indian heritage in Britain in the 18th century, he chose to run, run away. You're looking here at an advertisement published in a British paper um, seeking the recovery of a self-emancipated um, slave in Britain. As I mentioned, um, a display is now um, underway at the centre, um, and this is going. To, this is um, put up in parallel to the web story, uh, which Eric James is now going to speak about. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Abby, and and. Thanks to the whole team for all of this great research. Um, so, so we had all of this and we're thinking, so how are we going to um, talk about this to the public? Um, we knew we wanted to do some kind of timeline. Um, so we started out, let me share my screen. With, with, this, with this night lab timeline, which looks okay, um, but it actually had several accessibility issues and we wanted to make sure we were compliant and we could get to the full audience. Um, so we switched, so, so we had the center's Drupal platform and decided to go with that. Um, here's an example of that page and I encourage all of you to uh, visit it if you can. Um, this one is much better suited accessible ex with accessibility concerns. It's template based, so it makes it very easy to use. And just with a little bit of, of uh, programming and CSS um, knowledge, we could create this. Um, one of the things we wanted to do when, when talking about this was, you know, we, th there's this thing like, if you've ever seen Ken Burns documentary, um, he has that Ken Zoom effect where you're able to pan zoom into pictures um, and, and create a very uh, aesthetically pleasing presentation. Um, could we do this? And it ends up we could because we are implementing a technology called IIIF. Um, IIIF is, is, a, is a specification. Um, basically, you provide to it high quality images. Um, behind the scenes, there's an image encoder which takes when you ask for certain parts of the image at different um, resolutions, that part of the painting. Um, so in addition to this, there is an application online by a company, Cog App, which allows you to pull this IIIF together and make a nice presentation. So what, what, what you're seeing here um, and is an implementation of this where it's panning in and zooming into the different sections of the painting um, where the captions to highlight um, the parts. Um, that's, it's a very nice way to present um, things as, as Ed went into great detail about earlier. Um, the other thing is we had this, as Ed mentioned too, this, this empty wall where we returned about enough about you and the 1971 underwent analysis. Um, so, so what we did was we, we put a QR code on the wall. Um, pretty sure all of you are familiar with, with, with QR codes. Um, there's, they just allow you to click your, your camera on it and it'll take you to a, a page associated with the code. So, so, so you put that up the wall and you got some responses. Um, the question was um, taking into consideration the experience of those who visit the Market Museum, how should the institution display artwork that contains content that is potentially distressing? Um, we didn't get too many um, 
responses, we did get some. And um, most of them were about kind of keeping the history. Um, this first, this last one, I said, I think it should stay. It shows a snapshot into the history that should be remembered and not censored. What is art if it's not offensive? And, uh, another comment with an explanation of what is depicted, but it's important not to brush these on the carpet, carpet we learn from history. Uh, another comment I understand that you put that some works of art contain some offensive messages, but please stop trying to change history. The best solution is to lay both work side by side so that everyone can understand them better, which is a great success suggestion. Although the, the artist Titus um, actually made clear that he didn't want them up side by side, but that would be an interesting option. And one more comment, the museum should simply put the painting back. The visitors should understand the context of their times. This is preferable to erasing history by removing it. So our work is available online. And as I said before, please check it out. Um, that's it for me. Thanks. I think uh, that concludes the presentation from the Yale Center for British Art team. We do have uh, some time for Q&A um, until we um, close at nine o'clock. Um, I will invite everyone to um, put either put their questions in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask your um, questions directly. Uh, you can also raise your hand and I will call on you. While we're waiting, um, question for the Yale Center for British Art team. Can you let us know what your uh, current visiting hours are um, for the public? Yes, we are open Friday through Sunday. Um, Friday, if I'm not mistaken, we're open 12 to seven. And then Saturday and Sunday, we are 12 to four. We're also open to all Yale ID holders uh, throughout the week, classes, um, visits to the reference library and to our study room. You only need to make an appointment with either of those entities or individually with curators if you would like to see a specific object. And we really welcome Yale ID holders to come throughout the week. Um, we're in the building by ourselves, so please come visit us. Uh, I had a question emailed to me um, they wanted to know what gallery Titus Kafar's work was in. So can you just um, again tell people how to get to that? Uh, the was it the? Um, do you think we're talking about the one that I showed? Uh, the uh, one with the broomstick, maybe. I think um, I'm assuming so. Yes. Um, that one is in um, Birmingham. Um, actually, it's kind of funny. It's actually closely tied to Yale. Um, but yeah, that's in the collection now. Well, I don't see any additional questions. I, uh, oh, Ms. Shaw, come through. I have a question because usually, I guess, dress depicts um, the status of, um, of a person. So when, um, when, I, when I look at the, at the child, he's dressed like the adults. The material isn't as elaborate as the adults and the adults wear wigs. What's the significance of the turban on the young man? Or is there any significance? It's just that it just seems odd that he has the turban. It must mean something. It's something that you see um, in a number of paintings and other depictions of people of African and Indian heritage in Western art. And I think it is a device to essentially to other that, that person and um, to, to indicate that they are from what them would have been deemed to be, you know, sort of use their language as sort of exotic place. Um, it's also um, the, again, to use 
uh, like wildly outmoded language, the, the children, if they're not described as black, might be described as, as black amours as well. And there is this, um, in this period, there is a sort of conflation of um, more, Moorish dress. Mm -hmm. So people okay. from North Africa and, pe and people from Sub-Saharan Africa. But these things get sort of um, spun together and confused. So that, that's what's influencing the dress. It's sort of, it's a, a, a crude misunderstanding of, of, of Moorish dress. Mm, okay. Shaw, there's, there's also the element of fantasy that I think that's at play here. And, and Ed is exactly right that there is this, uh, this way, it is, a, it is about making something, um, it, making that person more exotic in a sense, even though in fact, in, in an everyday sense, these people are you know, working alongside you, living in your household, visible on the streets, right? But then throughout uh, the UK, as well as uh, Europe, as people began to take on, uh, take colonial missions, go to uh, countries in, uh, in other places, um, they bring back things. So fabric returns, um, an understanding of costume and dress and things like that return. Many people who have never been to any of those places have seen fabric, textile things that come from those places and are then fantasized or fantasizing about the uses and abilities of, of those new materials. Silk in particular becomes something that people want to render um, as it comes from Asia um, in different ways. And so it is not just that this painting in terms of, of its costuming is of a piece with other period paintings in which dress is really played up, particularly in the, the body of the, of the small person that can be made to be vis to visualize something that other people haven't seen anyway. So that, that element of fantasy is very much a part of this as well. Okay, so using their imagination. Um, okay, thank you, thank you. I have a chat question. How has this uh, wonderful research impacted the Yale Center for British Art organization? I, I can only tell you in, in sort of small ways and maybe others can, can answer this, but I would say that for me, figuring out that these five colleagues um, were able to do this work was overwhelming. I, I would never have imagined that you could carry out something like this remotely in such a short period of time. Um, you know, I've never done research remotely. I've never done anything. I've never done an extensive project of this level um, and this, uh, thoroughness and high standard. I, I've personally, I've never even experienced one. And so the fact that they were able to do this in such a way and, it, and everyone, you know, they're speaking as a group but everyone actually has um, a really uh, articulated skill set here that comes together that makes the whole project. So, you know, I feel um, grateful um, to be working with a staff like this and overwhelmed by what they've been able to achieve to achieve. And, and in many ways also um, astonished that we could that we, I shouldn't say we, because I didn't do it. They could do this in this short period of time. And without, you know, no one's venturing out to see any of these things because remember we were in a pandemic. So it, it's really, it's, it is a feat. Did anyone else want to speak to that? I'll just pipe up and say that also some of us have never worked on anything like this before. Um, so it's been an amazing opportunity um, for, for the group and it's been incredible and it's ongoing. So, um, you know, I hope there's more to come. Thank you. I'd like to add that um, and to thank my colleagues for all the work that they've done. It's um, it's enhanced all of our understanding of this particular work. Um, and it brings a wide range of reactions from the public. Everything from those people who do not want to look at this, who are offended by it, who are hurt by it, to those who want to do a deep dive into understanding why Yale has this painting, um, why it has a prominent place in our permanent collection, um, and it has an interesting story to tell beyond, and that is how we can best serve um, our different publics uh, and understanding their reactions, 
how we should deal with it, how we can deal with it, uh, and talking with the public and um, having honest conversations about what is the role of a museum in providing um, looks into the past and how sometimes you know memory can be used as a form of resistance, um, how it deals with collective history of uh, different people um, uh, and different times. Uh, I think that it's befitting in terms of the world in which we live in today and that it is direct, uh, directing head on um, a lot of the things that are happening um, amongst uh, throughout the country in terms of um, politics and education, uh, race um, and history. And as an ed uh, educator, um, I'm, uh, uh, I'm thrilled that we have so much to work with and for everything that my colleagues have been able to put together to broaden the, um, the deep dive into this particular picture. Thank you. For that, we are going to uh, conclude this morning's uh, uh, breakfast. Uh, I added the British uh, Yale Center for British Arts uh, website in the chat. Uh, Courtney also uh, uh, provided a link. I see Eric provided a link as well. Um, I want to thank uh, Courtney, Ed, Abby, Linda, and Eric for joining us as our featured speakers this morning. Um, if you reach out to the website, I'm sure you can get in touch with any or all of them with follow-up questions. Um, I also encourage you to go down and visit to speak with them in person. So thank you again uh, for joining us, um, and we will see you next month. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.